Now, we shall proceed to session four, titled Diversity and Identity, where we will focus on how the flows of people and culture in the region and into Singapore have shaped Singapore's unique identity as a diverse, multiracial, multireligious, and multilingual nation. The two speakers for this session are Associate Professor Farish Ahmad Noor of S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies at Nanyang Technological University and Professor Brenda Yeo, who is Raffles Professor of Social Sciences at the Department of Geography in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, NUS. To moderate the session, we're privileged to have Professor Vinita Sinha, who is Head of the Department of Sociology in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, NUS. As we did earlier, we will now feature the final video clip of young Singaporeans reflecting on the Singapore Bicentennial, and this time around the theme of multiculturalism. After that, the time will be handed over to Prof. Vinita to introduce the topic at hand and to invite the speakers to present their views. Please give your attention to the screen. Thank you. Singapore has been trading with other countries like China, India and Europe also. So basically we have been interacting with other cultures since a long time ago. So in Singapore, unlike many other countries, we can see all the four uh, different races uh, talking to each other and we are interacting. I find that our multiculturalism okay, is very precious because this doesn't happen in many other countries. I find it very special in Singapore that we just, um, like in the void deck, we see auntie, uncle and we just call them no matter their race or their background. And especially when I feel like we compare to other countries, we're one of the few countries who have racial harmony and peace in Singapore and it's something that I find I'm very grateful for and I feel it's something about Singapore that I'm very proud of. Another part of multiculturalism is that we get to try different cuisines from different races. And the hawker centre part is like a place where everybody can have, can choose to eat different cuisines like from different races. Hawker culture has always been part of Singapore's history and that we can like go around and try food from different cultures, especially we are like multiracial society. When we develop, develop to become a strong nation, hawker centres were one of the things that really um, bonded Singaporeans because of the diverse cultures and food. There's a lack of understanding and sensitivity with regards to race matters. People seem to be unknowingly participating in casual racism um, and then they unknowingly say things or do certain things that they don't realise hurt their, their peers of different races. Sometimes there's still that sense of us excluding a few people once in a while and I think that we should really try to like stop that from happening as much as possible. A lot of us choose to tolerate each other's religion instead of accepting it. And I think we need to work on accepting each other's religion, ethnicity, um, culture, to really progress as Singapore. I do feel there are many cases of racism coming about in the recent years and the recent months. And I feel like we really, really need to go and um, check out this issue and sort of like solve it before it gets a bit out of hand. Right now, people tend to walk on eggshells around these subjects. I think starting young, maybe we can perhaps, you know, have more conversations about these things. And from just racial um, tolerance, maybe we can move towards a understanding of one another. I hope in the future, Singapore uh, won't have racism. And so we can all live harmoniously and you don't have to worry about uh, people judging you based on your race. Thank you very much for your attention and welcome everyone to this afternoon's session, uh, session four on diversity and identity. I'm very delighted to be here and it's my privilege to um, hear two illustrious uh, speakers. 
uh, with considerable research experience in these areas. Um, Associate Professor Farish Ahmad Noor, who's from the S. Rajaratnam School of International Relations, and Professor Brenda Yeo, Raffles Professor of Social Sciences, Department of Geography, National University of Singapore. Um, so I'm not going to take too much time except to say that this is clearly a very um, topical question, uh, the question of identities and uh, diversities, uh, of course diversity of different kinds, and uh, it's been very current, it's always in the news, and we look forward to uh, hearing from our two speakers. So uh, Farish is going to speak first uh, for about 20 to 25 minutes, followed by Brenda, and then we will have um, questions after that. So may I invite Farish to speak first, please? Um, thank you very much, Vinita, and thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for this invitation. Um, I propose to, to, to be brief and get straight to the point. Um, I suppose what I'd like to talk about is, is about our colonial inheritance, uh, the, the legacy of multiculturalism and how we've come to understand it today. And, and I think when discussing the politics of identity, the praxis of identity formation, in the context of post-colonial Southeast Asia, including post-colonial Singapore, it's important for us to interrogate the vocabulary that we use on a daily basis. Let me start with an example that's actually uh, from outside Singapore. Um, I often cite this as an example of how identities were once understood in the context of a pre-colonial Southeast Asian world. Um, I'm drawing from uh, a text that I think is well known in our part of the world, the Hikayat Hang Tuah. Uh, some of you, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. When you look at the story of, of Hang Tuah in the text itself, at one point in the second half of the text, Hang Tuah leaves Malacca and he travels to the kingdom of Kalinga in India. And upon arrival, He's greeted by the king of Kalinga and the courtiers of the Kalinga court, and he's asked, who are you? And he says, I am Tua, a man of Malacca. The king of Kalinga takes a shine to Hang Tua, likes him so much that after his stay in India, the king of Kalinga dispatches him to China. And upon arrival in China, he meets the courtiers of the emperor of China, and he's asked, who are you? And he says, I am Tua, man of Kalinga. Now that for me is, is highly indicative. It's a very important episode that a lot of people forget. It's highly indicative of how identities were once understood by Southeast Asians and Asians in general in the pre-modern, pre-colonial period where identities were fluid, this fluidity of identity, the ability for Tua to be a man of Malacca, a man of Kalinga at the same time. It reminds me of the work of K.N. Chaudhuri, Asia Before Europe, uh, politics and commerce in the Indian Ocean before the arrival of colonialism in the 18th century, where Chaudhuri looks at how identities were understood in a very complex, very messy way by Asians who lived in a very complex and a very messy Asia. And this is a complexity that Asians, including Southeast Asians, in particular Southeast Asians were comfortable with because as we know, historically, Southeast Asia has been at the crossroads between East and West, China and India and other parts of Asia. And so movement, settlement, fluidity, migration, these are all norms of life. And our identities have grown complex as a result. Now that was set to change from the 18th century onwards as a result of the colonial encounter, particularly with the arrival of the colonial companies, the East India Company, the Dutch East India Com Indies Company, the French Compagnie des Andes, the Spanish Compagnia de las Indias Orientales, all these companies that brought with them the logic of nationalist mercantilism the conflicts in Europe where identities were becoming more and more solid, more and more fixed, more and more static, were imported to Asia and Southeast Asia in particular. And with that, you know, emerged a different kind of politics. Our societies have always had a means of understanding identities that were complex and different. We've always 
developed, we've already developed a vocabulary of our own to deal with differences on a cultural, linguistic, religious, ethnic level. But the logic of racialized colonial capitalism, particularly from the 19th century onwards, introduced a different kind of understanding of multiculturalism. And this is the point I want to emphasize. When talking about multiculturalism today, we cannot forget the historical origins of this term, and these terms change meaning over time. What we understand as multiculturalism today may be different from how our ancestors in pre-colonial Southeast Asia understood it. This is a common feature of all words. Any linguist will tell you that. If someone speaks jive to me and calls me a cool cat, it doesn't mean I've turned into a feline with low body temperature, right? The word cat means something else. So just because the term looks the same doesn't mean it means the same. The change that happens, I think, in the context of Southeast Asia, particularly as what we now call Singapore, Malaysia, Burma, Philippines, Indonesia, came under colonial rule, was a kind of top-down colonial technocratic, bureaucratic governance of difference and diversity, often couched in terms of a compartmentalizing logic where identities gradually over time become more and more fixed. It's not an accident, I think, that in many of the colonies in Southeast Asia, you know, the ethnic census or the racial census was introduced in order to divide and rule. That's a very different kind of multiculturalism compared to the multiculturalism that we had in Southeast Asia prior to the colonial contact, when at least Asians were able to determine their own political futures and determine you know, how their societies ought to be governed. This is a different kind of logic. Colonial multiculturalism, I would argue, was never about bringing communities together. It was always about keeping communities apart. And it was augmented with a vocabulary of scientific, pseudo-scientific theories of racial difference. And it was upon that basis of a divided society that the daily praxis of colonization, the management of colonized societies took place. And we know this, we look at the urban landscape of all of post-colonial Southeast Asia. This accounts for how and why you know, our cities are divided into cantonments or wards or, or, or sections for different groups. An Arab quarter here, a Chinese quarter there, an Indian quarter here, a Malay quarter there. This is not accidental. It's part and parcel of how colonization worked then. However, recent research, contemporary research, including research done in Singapore, shows that Asians, Southeast Asians, have always resisted this. You know, the Jackson plan to basically carve up Singapore into different ethnic enclaves never really worked at the ground level. Um, I recently watched a, a, a video um, related to our bicentennial celebrations that showed that, in fact, in real life, ordinary Southeast Asians continue to transgress, 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 spill over these boundaries all the time. Now, <clears throat> when talking about multiculturalism today, therefore, and when we look at the achievements of the post-colonial states of Southeast Asia, including Singapore from the 50s onwards, I think it's very important to note that whatever success they may or may not have been, whatever success we have achieved in terms of you know, building our complex societies and managing our complex societies has happened not because of colonization, but despite of colonization. And any success, therefore, should be, I believe, rightfully attributed to post-colonial Southeast Asians. We have, despite everything, managed to build nation states that are diverse and complex, and in some ways try to manage these differences, these, these exclusionary um, um, uh, praxis that we were lumbered with, our ancestors were lumbered with for more than 100 years. Which brings me to the politics of identity today. Now, I'm a historian, and I'm a historian with a bent on philosophy, with a philosophical background, and I'm particularly interested in the history of ideas. So the politics of identity for me is actually something very, very interesting. It's very relevant for the times we live in. Looking at the world today, and I'm not sure how many of you are capable of reading the news in the morning because I've reached saturation point, global news is just so depressing these days because of the rise of ethno-nationalism, forms of majoritarian politics, 
So many of these political projects that we are seeing all across the Asian continent today claim to be projects that are emancipatory, liberating, enabling, empowering, but in so many ways they are built upon a vocabulary that was inherited from the age of empire. I'm worried about these tendencies because we seem today, we post-colonial Southeast Asians seem to think of identity in terms of a 19th century definition of it, where identities are understood in purely exclusive, fixed, static terms. But historians will tell you that you can't write totalized national histories. If you're going to, for instance, you know, do a summary or a report card on the success of Singapore or the other countries of Southeast Asia, we can't write a totalized history because the Singaporean story is not over. None of the stories are over. Nations are constantly works in progress. And the, and the point of that is that in the process of nation building, which is a continuous process, debates, discussions, contestations necessarily occur. There's nothing unique about this. It's a perfectly mundane thing. It's a normal thing. But in the course of this, you know, the process of decolonization also has to take place. A way through which we, post-colonial Southeast Asians, and this includes Singaporeans, you know, can come to terms with the past, address the complexities in society today, and anticipate the challenges that lie ahead in the future. But for us to do this, one, we must be aware of the historical legacy. The vocabulary that we use, vocabularies don't just drop out of the sky. They're inherited. We inherit our vocabularies, and with those vocabularies come certain unstated assumptions and biases that are built into them. That interrogation is necessary, otherwise nations can't progress. Two, by virtue of understanding the fact that no nation's history can be totalized, that the national story continues, continues, continues. There is no full stop to this text. That, that narrative has to be inclusive. It has to address the complexities that lie within. But that requires a sense of comfort. Comfort. Comfort with complexity. Comfort with diversity, which I think today is becoming more and more difficult, partly because of the way in which identities have become so politicized and become, in a sense, even commodified. I mean, look at Southeast Asia today and how we in Southeast Asia continue to self-exoticize ourselves. You know, um, invariably, when you watch most Southeast Asian tourist ads in our desire to attract the tourist dollar, we repeat all the colonial tropes and metaphors of the exotic East, the fantastic East, the underdeveloped East, or what have you. Most of the tourist ads of Southeast Asia will invariably fe feature uh, the obligatory coconut tree, banana tree, and orangutan. <laughs> the orangutan doesn't even get paid. And yet, in the course of doing so, we repeat many of these cliches, and that includes how we relate to one another. I was very interested watching that video just now, looking at young people and how young people are questioning you know, these categories. And I think this is the role of the educator. This is what education does. Like I said, I wanted to be brief, so I want to get to the point. I think the challenges that lie ahead for Singapore are the same challenges that lie ahead for Southeast Asia. We, as we know, live in a very important period in our region's history, our sense of connectivity, our sense of belonging, locating ourselves in this region to have an identity that is not simply local but also regional is hugely, hugely important. But for us to do that, we must embrace the idea that we are many things at the same time. I'm a father, a son, and a husband at the same time. Being a son doesn't negate me being a husband. And I think all of us have to embrace this complexity in ourselves in the same way that at one point, as Chowdhury shows in his work, Asians in the pre-colonial era were able to live with di this diversity and complexity and realize their interconnections, their cross-cultural, cross-border dependencies, how our vocabularies are inherited from other parts of Asia, how our identities are formed through this melange of, of, of cultural wedding, in a sense. But look at the state of Southeast Asia today and look at our national narratives and our regional narratives, and you see that this hasn't really taken place. Despite all this talk of decolonization, we've not really decolonized. Our mental map is a colonial map. Look at the map of Southeast Asia, it's a colonial map. <laughs> 
We still think of identities in fixed, static, and exclusive tone terms. We make cultural claims that are exclusive, um, inward-looking. I mean, look at the stupid disputes that we have in our part of the world. For heaven's sakes, we fight over chicken rice. You know, we fight over batik, things which predate the emergence of our nation states as we know today. Now, why is there this disconnect? Now, earlier, I focused on the way in which colonial politics divided communities, including communities in Singapore. But more than that, it divided our region as well. It broke our connections with this maritime world of Southeast Asia. Now, if there's one thing I'm thankful for, for all these discussions that we've had this year, this being Singapore's bicentennial, I think one idea that has popped up again and again is the need the idea that there is a need to somehow relocate Singapore in the context of the wider maritime world of Southeast Asia, that it is part of this wider maritime world, our sense of belonging to a common shared Southeast Asian world. This sense of belonging, this sense of us having multiple identities, being, say, Singaporean and Southeast Asian at the same time, these are not exclusive, and these are things that need to be worked on but sadly, I feel that they are being neglected. And I say this as, as an academic who not only lectures in Singapore, but also in Indonesia and in Malaysia and other parts of Southeast Asia. I'm stunned by the fact that many young Southeast Asians may declare themselves to be Southeast Asians, but know very little about the world they live in. We actually do not know our region. And I'll say this bluntly. I think many Singaporeans do not know Malaysia. I think many Malaysians do not know Thailand. I think many Thais do not know Burma. Just because we are neighbors doesn't mean we know one another. And just because we live in Southeast Asia doesn't mean that we are Southeast Asians. Like someone who works in a bank doesn't mean that person knows banking, right? So why is there this disconnect? <clears throat> why is there this disconnect? This is a disconnect, this is a historical disconnect. Because the dismemberment of our societies, our communities, our region was the result of a historical process which we need to address and we need to be blunt about. I'll, I'll give you an anecdote. I teach a course about state society and politics of Southeast Asia at my school, RSIS. For my first class, I ask all my students to do this and I have students from all over Southeast Asia. I tell them to turn off their handphones which is already a challenge, of course, yeah? For, 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 for some people, it's like having your arm cut off. Now turn off your handphone and turn off your laptop. Now take out a blank piece of paper. Yes, paper, it does exist. Take that blank piece of paper and a pen and draw me a map of Southeast Asia. More often than not, none of them can do it. Now this, for me, is hugely telling. They can draw me a map of Middle Earth, though, they can tell me how to get to Gondor from Isengard. They can draw me a map of Westeros, but they can't draw me a map of Southeast Asia. Now, what does that tell us? What does it tell us? It tells us how our identities today, we live, we're talking about identities in an age of competing literacies. In an age of competing literacies where one has to be historically literate, politically literate, culturally literate, philosophically literate, economically literate, all at the same time. And these pressures are enormous, especially on the younger generation. But the reason why I feel that this engagement with history, an honest questioning and interrogation of our categories of identity are necessary is because you know, this is not simply an academic exercise. It's crucial to the survival of the states and the societies of Southeast Asia, including Singapore. We, as we all know, are on the verge of perhaps one of the biggest tectonic socioeconomic shifts in Southeast Asian history. Our region has been buffeted by winds of change throughout for thousands of years, hundreds of years. We have been invaded, we have been colonized, but again and again, each generation of Southeast Asians has been, been able to survive this because of this ability to adapt, change, adapt, change, adapt, change. Now, with the coming age of new technologies, the fourth industrial revolution, AI, it will be a crucial factor for survival of anyone that they must be mobile. I believe, and this is a personal belief on my part, um, that our definition of success 
particularly for this younger generation, will be very different from our generation. My generation, it was easy. Get a job, mother happy. Get married, mother even more happy, right? For the next generation, geographical mobility, professional mobility, job mobility are all going to be interlinked. The survivability of Southeast Asians, and this includes Singaporeans, means an awareness of the complexities of our landscape, our social landscape, our historical landscape, and ability to move, 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 and to know who you are in a region that is complex. This means necessarily having an ability to have and sustain and balance multiple identities at the same time, very much like the circus trick where you're balancing 10, 20 plates at the same time. So I want to stop early because I want to have a discussion. I, need, I want to know what you think. I want to know how people in Singapore look at this uh, issue now. The questions and the points raised by the students that we saw earlier in the video shows that this thinking is now taking place. It must be addressed and it should be encouraged. But it means that we have to learn to embrace messiness and complexity and diversity. And it's not always nice, it's not always pleasant. Let me end with an anecdote. Um, talking about messiness and complexity and how we need to get out of our settled assumptions, some of which are historically wrong, by the way. Um, years ago, I was doing field work among the Bajau Laut. Uh, these are sea nomads who live in the um, Sulawesi Sea. They live at sea on a boat, on boats. I woke up one morning in the boat, and right next to me, in the water, at sea, were a bunch of five-year-old kids swimming. They were swimming from boat to boat. And I thought to myself, I was with a Singaporean camera crew at the time, and I said, you know what, this is the ultimate Singaporean parents' nightmare, you know? <laughs> but why can Bajau kids swim at sea? Because from the moment they can walk, their parents throw them into the water. That's messiness, get used to it. This is our world. We live in a complex, messy world. Get used to it, get used to it, get used to it. That's incredible resilience. And that comfort with complexity is then reflected in the way the Bajaos understand themselves. Compared to many other nations in the world, many other communities in the world, the Bajau have a very, very interesting myth of origin. Yeah. Um, in the Bajau cosmology, most nations trace their origins to one place. We come from here. We originate from there. But the Bajau has a, th a, 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 a cosmology where they have actually multiple points of origins. We come from everywhere. And so we are comfortable everywhere. And we are many things. In so many ways, the Bajau, by virtue of the fact that by being sea nomads, they were among the least likely to be impacted by colonization, they seem to me to be among the Southeast Asians today who are truly mentally free, culturally free, who still have an epistemology and a vocabulary of their own. The challenge that's facing Singapore and Southeast Asia at large is, you know, multiple. Addressing our past, dealing with the unstated biases and assumptions that lie in our political vocabulary, including the vocabulary of identity, and being comfortable with this complexity and difference. Singapore has, over the last few decades, grappled with its complexity within. This is a debate that continues. And as a foreigner here in Singapore, I'm very interested in watching this debate because I see a lively debate. I've seen Singapore evolve over the last 10 years that I've been here. This, for me, is a positive thing. And I think this dynamic is something that needs to be encouraged and pushed further because it is there in that crucible, in that critical mess, that new imaginings can emerge. What we understand as multiculturalism today, I think will evolve and change over time. And the key, as I said earlier, is to disentangle ourselves from a particular fixed understanding of what multiculturalism means. Thank you. Thank you, Farish, for um, flagging our attention to region, to history. Um,
to uh, colonialism and to uh, the importance of map drawing, and our next speaker knows very well about all of that. Uh, so let me invite Brenda to please speak to us specifically about multiculturalism and identity formation in Singapore. Thank you very much. I mean, good afternoon, and um, for this, and thank you for this opportunity to share some thoughts on m migration-led diversity in uh, Singapore, a post-colonial nation, city-state. So questions of diversity and identity have gained salience uh, in recent times, as I think we all know, particularly the effects of uh, migration-led diversification on the social texture of, of cities, countries, and regions. So in Singapore, one of the primary tasks of post-colonial nation building is to transform a motley crew of sort of diasporic peoples into one settled people with a clear identity vested in the nation state. So this task is of course both challenging and crucial, although I think we need to remember that the concept of nationhood as we know it today only gained currency from the end of, the world, of world War II. So in that sense, if I get this right, I mean, uh, this, this kind of context is important to our understanding of Singapore's place in time. So sandwiched between the large polities of China and India, Southeast Asia has always had a long history that I think Farish was talking about in terms of migrations, mobilities, circulations, connecting diverse societies ranging from merchants, monks, sailors, rebels to the coolie trade. I think many of us can count probably uh, a, a merchant, a coolie, and maybe a re rebel amongst our ancestors. So from its emergence as a British trading post to its current ambitions uh, to become a global city-state, Singapore's fate and fortunes are deeply entwined with this kind of migration history. So since this is the bicentennial conference, it will be a miss of me not to say something about the year 1819 and its place in history. In 2019, the moment that we are occupying, um, our bicentennial calculations mark this year, 1819, with some ambivalence, I would say, as the beginning of Singapore's 200-year history since Raffles arrived. But if we wind back time, at, at the turn of the 19th century, 1819 actually featured quite differently in the calculation of milestones in Singapore's history. So during the Diamond Jubilee, uh, celebrations, this is in 1897, the municipal commissioners depicted Singapore's runaway success and ascendancy as a premier port and trading centre in tandem with Queen Victoria's glorious reign, founded in the year of Your Majesty's birth, which was 1819. I mean, how many of us know that? Uh, Singapore was but a small place of a few thousand inhabitants with little trade at Your Majesty's ascension in 1837. So Singapore was still not very much uh, in 1837, but in, at the turn of the century, it is a city of 200,000 inhabitants, one of the largest seaports in the world, um, and a collecting and distribution center for all the vast trades in, in the region. So at the height of colonial rule, 1819 was a significant year as it marks Queen Victoria's birth. Singapore's phenomenal trajectory was inextricably intertwined with her glorious reign. But, of course, uh, this intertwining unraveled and history took a different course. I narrate that because what I was trying to, in a sense, uh, reflect on is the fact that uh, historical milestones are imbued with different meanings depending on the priorities of the present and the privilege of hindsight. It will be interesting, I think, to reflect on how the discussions today at this conference will be analysed come the year 2119, when we mark our tricentennial year. So in that sense, I say everything with, um, with a lot of caution because I don't want to appear in the history books of a uh, 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 100 years later as uh, to be accused of saying something that um, I would not be, in a sense, uh, comfortable with. So with that, let me get back to the, the story. I mean, and uh, basically I want to, in a sense, talk about three different uh, strands. The first is to reflect historically on race diversity and its colonial antecedents. And, um, and then I'll get on to the, the next two sections if hopefully I have time. So in uh, colonial Singapore, sorry. In Singapore, basically, I mean, oh, okay, let me just 
Yeah, so we are, of course, a small, natural resource scarce city state that's intensely part of global service capitalism and open to immigration since uh, the very beginning. So as a colonial, in, during the colonial era, we gained importance as a trading port, uh, and that was largely buttressed by a liberal open-door policy in immigration. Uh, 200 years later, the age of globalization, as aspiring sort of global city competing for a place in the top league, um, we are also the convergence node of transnational flows of ideas, of people, of money, commodities, and so forth. So, in short, in colonial Singapore, um, migration was key to Singapore's demographic diversity. Uh, Singapore's rapidly expanding economy and premier role as a transaction point could only be supported by a liberal open-door policy on immigration, welcoming merchants, traders, and the coolie class, the so-called humble races in the colonial archives. So between the six sort of decades, between 1871 and 1931, the total population of uh, Singapore as a settlement increased by 24 to 43% each decade. So from about uh, 97,000 um, in 1871 to over half a million in 1931. And what's important to remember is that the dominant component of population growth at that time was migrational surplus. So because natural increase was actually negative. So it was negative because of the gross imbalance in Singapore's uh, sex ratio at that time so not many babies born, uh, but also because of the prevalence of high mortality rates that far outweighed the fertility rates. So in, in, in short, I mean, Singapore would not survive if we had not, we have only depended on natural increase that was negative. So the key causes of death then, uh, as this particular graphic of the angel of death showed, were, I don't know whether anyone of you would like to make a guess, what were the three top killers in Singapore? Well, I mean, I'm short of time, so I'll give you the answers. Um, one is uh, phthisis or TB. A second would be malarial fevers. And the third was beriberi. So those were the key killers of uh, people in Singapore. So, um, and in that sense, Singapore then had to depend largely on, on uh, migration in order to thrive. So if you look at the um, census, the colonial census, the, the terminology used is also very interesting. So by the turn of the 19th century in 1901, the population within municipal boundaries uh, was about 200,000, and that reflected a highly diverse complexion. 74% uh, Chinese of different dialect groups, 14% natives of the Malay archipelago, 8% natives of India, 2% Eurasians, 1% other nationalities, meaning Arabs, Jews, Sinhalese, and Japanese, and 1% Europeans. So, I mean, you could spend a whole sort of afternoon looking at the vocabulary used in colonial uh, census making, but uh, I will have to skip that for, for the time being. And basically, in a sense, come to my main point, which is that Singapore is truly the demographic child of overlapping diasporas in its, uh, that's from, its, from birth embodies many of the tensions of blood and belonging that the concept diaspora evokes, to quote uh, Tim Harper. Um, and if you look at uh, the right picture, the model of North Boat Key that was presented in 1886 at the Colonial and Indian Exhibition in London, this depicts a thriving sort of uh, street scene with a cosmopolitan kaleidoscope of different races, nationalities, and occupations. Even the women were allowed to peer out from the windows from the, on the upper floors, if you could see what the picture depicts. So this was how Singapore's cosmopolitan demography was presented and often celebrated. Um, but what I'm will be talking about a little bit more is that less is said about the processes of mixing, of fusion, of hybridization, the kinds of complexities that uh, Farish has already talked about in Southeast Asia. These were less evident and uh, not discussed as much. Um, so these creolized kind of cultures are adapted from multiple cultures of origins, like the Paranakans, the Eurasians, and so forth. This will be a theme that I will come back to in, in, a, in a while. So how was, so how was um, in a sense, Singapore's migration-induced diversity uh, perceived and governed? Uh, 
uh, in colonial Singapore. So while Singapore then did not feature a strict system of racial segregation, the diverse racial communities in the trading emporium were governed through a pragmatic tolerance for plural societies. So as Verneville noted, in a plural society, each group holds by its own culture and way of life. As individuals, they meet, but only in the marketplace, in buying and selling. So they don't interact, in a sense, outside of uh, the economic sphere. So at Raffles' master plan for Singapore that uh, Farish had already talked about, as translated by Lieutenant J Jackson, was set up precisely to facilitate governance of plural societies. Each race has its own sort of ethnic enclave, the Chinese kampong, the Chulia kampong, the Arab kampong, and so forth. Only Europeans had the privilege of residing in the town proper. Uh, this plan, of course, as Farish already mentioned, did not work, and it was regularly sort of transgressed, but it revealed the colonial racialized mindset. So under the logic of the plural society model, race-based communities and subgroups flourish under colonial rule, whilst political power remained concentrated in the hands of a colonial elite. One, on, on, on the one hand, membership of these sort of race-based communities bestowed a set of values and ways of perceiving that was reinforced by the community, as well as a network of uh, institutional support that provided cradle-to-grave services essential for immigrant life. So you look to your clan association for you know, jobs and for uh, a place to be buried in, you will not look to the colonial state. On the other hand, of course, authority is highly centralized as only the governor, to quote one of the colonial civil servants, by the careful use of the iron hand with a velvet glove, could hold together the different races and classes and creeds of which the community was, com was composed. Uh, and um, this is when I show you my favorite quote from the colonial governors uh, as it really reflected the ethos of the times. Um, this is uh, Governor Well in 1884. He says, I think the capacity for governance is a characteristic of our race, referring to the European race. And it's wonderful to see in a country like the Straits, a handful of Englishmen and Europeans, a large and rich Chinese community, tens of thousands of Chinese of the lower coolie class, Arabs and Parsi merchants, Malays of all ranks, and a sprinkling of all nationalities, living together in wonderful peace and contentment. It always seems to me that the common Chinese feeling is that we, an eccentric race, were created to govern and look after them, as a groom look after a horse, while they were created to get rich and enjoy the good things of the earth. So I guess we all, in a sense, laugh at the sort of pride and prejudice and patronage that's in this particular quote, but I always also try to think whether, in a sense, uh, some of the discourse that we produce today, whether it sort of approximates some of the, the three Ps here, the pride, the prejudice, and the patronage. Um, moving on then to um, beyond the colonial period with independence in 1965, immigration laws were modified to reinforce Singapore's borders as the fledgling nation state worked to establish its own identity as a sovereign state. So this new nation state had to enact closure in order to congeal uh, what uh, Gopal Bharatham calls the jelly of nationhood, a uh, really sort of evocative phase, phrase. Um, and um, this basically involves sort of uh, legislative changes to the uh, 1957 Singapore Citizenship Ordinance where everyone born in Singapore was conferred automatic citizenship. So those born in Malaya or were citizens of the UK and its colonies could become citizens if they had a minimum of two years of residence. And uh, all other aliens, as they were called, including those born in China, could apply for citizenship by naturalization with at least eight years residence. Here is where I pause to thank the heavens that I was conceived in Penang but came out in Singapore, so I was Singaporean from day one, so I mean, uh, could belong to the first category. So, um, and so, in that sense, within the first few years of independence, there were strict controls imposed on the import of foreign workers, but this had to be relaxed as industrialization went into full swing, resulting in, of course, uh, a large increase in the influx of uh, foreign labor. 
Um, my time is really running, so I shall um, go a bit faster. So towards the end of the 20th century, with declining fertility rates and sort of a more aggressive sort of immigration policy, I think uh, what we see in Singapore is uh, what the cartoonist calls diversity Singapore, as you see in this slide. So, and, um, so if you look at our population, basically over 10 years, 2008 to 2018, um, the uh, citizen part of the population has uh, declined from 68 to 62 percent, and it's the non-residents, remember the aliens uh, from somewhere else, uh, that uh, has uh, increased from 22 to 29 percent. Of course, there's been, uh, this is in the face of in, um, massive population growth from 4.5 million to 5.64 million. Okay, let me move on to my second theme, which is to look at the multiracial nation state and its invisibilities. So um, this is a familiar story, so let me be quick about this, that uh, in terms of the immediate post-colonial nation-building phase, and against this backdrop of a plural society with racialized categories that's been hardened by colonial policy, the new national leaders advocated the welding together of people uh, using the ideology of separate but equal multiracialism. So as the stem says, Singapore, many races, one people. So... Uh, Four official races were vaccinated, CMIO, as we all know, and this discourse of the four M's, multiracialism, multiculturalism, multilingualism, and multireligiosity, basically is, um, sets out to, in a sense, encourage acceptance of uh, different traditions, religions, and so forth amongst communities without discrimination for any particular community, to quote uh, Ambassador Chan. Uh, and... Um, so often depicted will be children of the four races standing under the national flag, um, as you see here. Uh, this is one of the more popular de depictions of CMIO multiracialism in the now defunct magazine Home. Um, and um, as the litmus test, perhaps, of our CMIO multiracialism, let's see how many of us are able to pronounce I, you, and we in the three official languages. Can you join me? So um, let's start from the, the left. Saya, awak kita, wo ni, woman. And here comes the challenge, right? So I had to like consult my uh, uh, colleagues. This is nan, ni, and nambe. So I mean, uh, in that sense, I mean, uh, whether we pass or not uh, the litmus test or multiracialism, I leave it to, to you to judge. Uh, in terms of the ethnic composition of the resident population in Singapore, this has remained fairly stable. Let me skip quickly. Uh, there's been sort of small increases or decreases. Others and Indians basically have increased by a couple of percentages. Malays and Chinese have decreased uh, by a couple of percentages as well. So while the CMIO categories have been relatively stable in the post-colonial nation state, uh, my argument is that these singular categories hide many kinds of diversity and one of which is, in a sense, uh, brought about by increasing international marriages that introduces diversity into the primary relations that constitute the family. So in 2017, cross-nationality marriages basically accounted for almost 30%, uh, while uh, marriage across ethnic categories made up about 22%. So, um, and... Um, this kind of more mixed unions, there's much discussion about this, but one of the reasons would be that uh, working class men in Singapore find it very hard in the marriage market and are ranging across the region uh, for brides, preferably women who are traditional and um, sort of docile and unlike sort of the well-educated, career-minded Singapore women many of them amongst us. So as you see in this particular um, sort of uh, marriage agency, it says here, you probably can't read, it's a bit small, it says a Vietnam wife is keen to do household chores and is willing to take care of parents wholeheartedly. I presume that's something that most Singaporean women are no longer willing to do. I don't know. Okay, so... Uh, <laughs> In, so in this, in this context then, what are the strategies going forward with sort of the family itself diversifying? So 
is hyphenation the way to go? So as I think we all know, in January 2010, uh, the policy innovation was to allow children of mixed marriages to choose between adopting the race of either father or mother or to use double-barreled race classifications in official documents. And in announcing this change, basically, the PM basically based the rationale on uh, inter international marriage across racial lines. Uh, but he also stressed that this policy is nothing to do with... Uh, uh, revolution. It is basically a liberation, liberalization to allow sort of parents greater choice, uh, but you still have to have a dominant race as put before the hyphen for all administrative purposes. So it gives choice, but it does not impact entrenched policy. And um, I searched high, high and low, couldn't find many official figures as to whether this policy, this hyphenation policy has been taken up. All I know is that uh, in the early years, in 2011, 2012, about 16% of mixed heritage babies uh, were, did uh, adopt this particular double barrel classification. Uh, and um, for, for the most part, uh, many mixed race Singaporeans do not feel the need to adopt this particular uh, classification. So as, as it says on the slide there, I mean, uh, you can tick Singapore, uh, you can tick Chinese, Indian, uh, others, and Chindian, and many other human, I suppose, would be uh, possible ways of identification. Um, so my point here is that uh, this, um, this issue raises, I think, important questions for our consideration, and I'd like to put up two here. So is this liberalization of identity politics without widening the base for claims making to gain cultural rights, a meaningful step forward in managing diversity uh, in the multiracial nation? That's my first question. And second, uh, it's uh, I think a more crucial question, is this active recognition of hyphenation basically a major step towards more flexible ways of thinking about race, cultivating cosmopolitan sensibilities and accommodating difference? Um, I don't have many answers, and I think I'll skip this. I was going to share some of the research that we did for, on Eurasians, but I'll leave that to, for the discussion because I want to use my last three minutes uh, for the second and last point I'll make, which is to do with the multiracial nation state and its exclusion. So, as a framework for inclusion, as we all know, CMIO multiracialism applies only to the resident population who are able to leverage ancestral cultures to claim belonging to the nation state. Non-residents, the 29% of the population, uh, regardless of uh, any commonality with ancestral cultures, are not able to exercise this claim. So the vast majority of this will be temporary migrant workers admitted into the nation state as transient labor with no or very limited rights uh, and pathways to residency and citizenship. So in terms of everyday sensibilities, this contradiction between a very large migrant population that's supposed to be transient, they're supposed to come here, do their work, and go home, and the very palpable visibility of migrant concentrations or what we call weekend enclaves, this have raised uh, social anxieties about the need to tighten control and surveillance to keep these populations out of sight. Uh, yeah, so as um, so these strategies of surveillance and, and control, for example, the, tight, the greater deployment of auxiliary police after the Little India riots, I mean, uh, these are conjoined also to containment strategies to create spaces of enclosure. Here you see um, the, the building of a mega dormitory at Tuas, uh, basically an integrated facility with six, 16,800 beds, a mini mart, beer garden, uh, recreational options like cinema, cricket field, and so forth. And if you can read the banner, it's, it's marketed as a modern mega and have sea view, right? So um, almost like the way that we promote our condominiums. So my question here is that um, does this kind of uh, appearances on the landscape uh, remind us of uh, colonial enclave societies? Are they, is their re re-emergence of enclave society not dissimilar to colonial enclaves? Um, and um, my final slide, if I could uh, just finish off here, is that uh, just to sum up, so under colonial rule, we see Singapore's liberal open door policy to immigration. That was a very important condition for its success, especially given the, that natural increase on the island was negative. So colonial Singapore's success was predicated on plural societies and managing 
sort of uh, in that framework uh, for governing, sorry, I mean, um, migration and diversity. So the colonial state was able to thrive on the lifeblood of migrant labor without taking responsibility of providing resources for its social reproduction. So in post-colonial Singapore, what has continued and what has changed? Um, I would like to pose three questions here. Uh, there are signs of the emergence of a new version of the enclave model, this time not so much along racial lines, but nationalist and class lines. Is nationalism the new racism? What responsibility does host society have for the social reproduction of migrant labor? And with ultra-low fertility rates today, should migrant labor be gradually and selectively uh, in integrated into the national geobody? Um, I had a couple of concluding remarks, basically just maybe just show you a couple of pictures that Singapore basically exemplifies this perplexity of being an island country that's both a nation state that needs sort of closure of boundaries in order for na nation state formation. And at the same time, we are also a, an aspiring global city that needs to be, uh, that has imperatives of openness necessary for its survival. And um, I'll just leave this quote. Uh, I think the PM in his wisdom basically talks about the need to get the balance just right between national identity and cosmopolitan openness, between free market competition and social solidarity. So, um, yeah, sorry to have to rush towards the end, but thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you very much. Uh, I think you will agree that both speakers have offered uh, very fresh perspectives on an old topic. Uh, they have invited us to ask uh, difficult and uncomfortable questions and challenge taken for granted assumptions. Um, and indeed invited us to make interventions in a conventional discourse. Uh, so in that spirit, I would like to invite questions. Um, we have about 40 minutes for uh, questions, and uh, please come forward to the microphones, which are all over the room, uh, to pose your questions. Um, may I request you to keep your questions brief, please? And we will collect questions. So I'll take three to four questions in each round. Yes, please. I'm Eileen Wong from uh, SUSS. I have a question for Professor Farish. Uh, you speak about Southeast Asia and the importance of, uh, or, or the, you know, the absence of a Southeast Asian identity. Uh, my question to you is, why is it important that people who live in Southeast Asia should develop a Southeast Asian identity? What kind of uh, sort of a purpose would it serve? Now, among the ASEAN community, we're talking about uh, the achievement of ASEAN economic community, social cultural community, and whatever. Uh, actually, ASEAN has been able to, in spite of its slow progress, to achieve quite a lot of it, uh, national cooperations on many fronts, health, economics, you know, environmental issues, and so on. So why do you want to add a further layer of Southeast Asian identity? Uh, it's going to be very difficult, and I'm, I don't expect we have answers. But the first question is, why is it important to have this identity? Thank you. My second question to you is, can we try to draw some lessons from the European community where there is actually a European identity which actually helps the EU to function as a regional sort of an entity? So what lessons can we draw from the EU community for the development of an ASEAN community and identity. Thank you. Next question, please. We are collecting questions, so yes, there's one right there, please. Uh, Professor Farish, you previously mentioned the act of balancing multiple identities. Uh, in light of heightened racial polarization in Southeast Asia and Singapore, uh, would you suggest that the promotion of a collective individual national identity take precedence over that of balan balancing other aforementioned identities in order to stymie internal conflict. Thank, Thank you. you. I'll take one more for this round. Yes, please. Hi, I'm, I'm Emily Orchin from UWC. Um, so both speakers spoke very eloquently and in depth about multiracialism. Um, but another big part of cultural diversity and identity is, of course, the LGBTQ plus community. 
Um, I was just wondering, where do you think this specific diversity is headed, and have attitudes towards this type of diversity shifted in our more modern society? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, you're going to skip this? Uh, Farish, do you want to go? Um, okay, why do we need to have a Southeast Asian identity? I think it's very simple. Partly, if you look at, and this relates to the young men's question, I you know what's, what's happening within societies, what's happening on the regional level. We see centrifugal forces because of the way we understand identities today. We think of identities in terms of identity cards, passports, or what have you. So our identities are fixed. The reason why I think a regional identity is important is that notwithstanding the success of ASEAN, and I consider myself a, 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 an ASEANist. I'm, 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 I really think ASEAN is one of the most important things that Southeast Asia has done uh, since the 60s. But notwithstanding the achievements of ASEAN, I think there's also a pushback factor which we're seeing in many parts of Southeast Asia today. Uh, you mentioned the um, ASEAN economic community. There's, there's, there's quite some pushback in some Southeast Asian countries because ASEAN is seen by some quarters uh, as basically you know, becoming the, the, the tool or the bridgehead for a kind of external foreign capital invasion of respective Southeast Asian countries. And this is why a sense of common Southeast Asian identity is important. I'll cite an example uh, that I know. Um, uh, in order to mitigate this, in Indonesia, over the last few years, the Indonesian government has invested money in a number of institutions, uh, such as the ASEAN Study Center at Gajah Mada University, Yogyakarta. What does this center do? It's not really a teaching center, but its job is to engage with the Indonesian public about the importance of ASEAN and our common Southeast Asian history and our common Southeast Asian destiny. And this is in response to certain kinds of narrow nationalist politics uh, from certain quarters in Indonesia who say that, oh, the AEC is a bad idea because Indonesian businesses will suffer. Uh, now, the role of these bodies, like the ASEAN Studies Center, is to go out and, and talk to ordinary Indonesians to say that, look, hang on, we are all Southeast Asian citizens. We are part of a common market. We need to work together, and actually ASEAN is a good thing. Um, and so don't fear ASEAN. Now, you can only do that if we feel that we belong to this region together, that Southeast Asia is our common home. And like I said earlier, I'm particularly concerned about the next generation of Southeast Asians who will have to be mobile. Mobility is, is going to, to be you know, um, um, a benchmark of success for the next generation. This idea you know, uh, held one generation ago where you, uh, you, know, you can be born in Singapore, you study in Singapore, you marry a Singaporean, you work in Singapore, you retire in Singapore, you die in Singapore, that's over for a lot of people, and this applies across Southeast Asia. You might be born in Singapore, you study in Singapore, you continue your studies in Malaysia, you, mer you meet an Indonesian, you join a company, your company moves you to Hanoi for a few years, and then the company moves you again to Manila, you then meet, you know, so mobility is gonna be important. You can only be mobile if you feel that Southeast Asia is not a foreign land. And because I'm a committed ASEANist, I would like all Southeast Asian citizens to feel that Southeast Asia is an, a kind of extension of our understanding of home. We should not feel like foreigners in each other's countries. So you have basically concentric circles of belonging. So that's my answer to you. ASEAN alone, remaining at a state-to-state -state level, can only achieve so much what ASEAN cannot do as a body, as a legal body, is that it cannot get into the hearts and minds of ordinary Southeast Asians and make them feel that we are actually friends and neighbors and part of a bigger family. The Indonesians have a nice way of putting it, Kluarga Basa, the extended family. And I think this is what I personally would like to see. Now, you talk about the EU. <clears throat> well, the EU and ASEAN are two completely different things. The EU is a legal body. It has laws. ASEAN doesn't have that. Yeah, so we can't compare. The two are not the same. But crucially, let's remember one thing. Unfortunately, like it or not, for the longest time, European identity was predicated in terms of an oppositional dialectics against a cultural other. And that cultural other was the Arab Muslim. Because that's how European identity emerged. You know? uh, its genesis is in cultural religious conflict. And this partly explains why today, when we look at Europe, with this, you know, 
uh, fear of migration, refugees, or what have you. You know, the refugee scare is basically a repeat. All these tropes and metaphors, this language that goes back hundreds of years is now coming out again. Europe being invaded, Europe being invaded, Europe being invaded. We don't have that kind of experience in Southeast Asia. So I think it's very important to be, to pay, I think, attention to the historical specificities of different regions. I think Europe has done a lot, but we are not Europe. We have a very different political history and a very different institutional history. And ASEAN has not attempted to do what Europe has done, which is to aim towards singularity. I think that was the mistake of the EU. The more you, 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 you aim for singularity, the more you invite a backlash. And I think this is what we have, we've, we have been seeing in, in Europe over the last few years. Um, to go back to the question about identities, you know, and how national identities or, uh, can supersede identities. Yes and no. It's not a panacea. Uh, it's not as if, you know, if you have a sense of citizenship, it, 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 it negates other identities. The, the question is, uh, this is something that I think all of us in Southeast Asia have to pay attention to. I believe that we are one of the most culturally complex parts of the world. Every major religion is represented in Southeast Asia. We have countries that are majority Muslim. We have countries that are majority Christian, Philippines. We have majority Buddhist. We have significant visible presence of Hindus, Taoists, Confucianists all over Southeast Asia. This basically means that every cultural conflict in any other part of the world becomes our problem because of the spillover effects. So while national identity, citizenship is important because it gives you another level of belonging or attachment, it cannot negate it cannot, and it should not, negate your other identities as well. I don't think it should ever come to a point where you have a kind of, um, what I think is an, almost an extreme form of secularism in some European countries where, you know, to be, to be a citizen of country A, you somehow have to underplay or downplay your religious identity. It should never be that. It should never be a choice where, you know, you're either <clears throat> religious or a citizen. Um, I don't think that would work in our context. So the question again is of balance. And like I said, nations are work in progress, works in progress. And I think we are witnessing this, this playing out in, in Southeast Asia. Um, as to the last uh, question about gender, well, you know, again, if you look at the history of Southeast Asia, you'll find that you know, gender, gender identities have always been complex in, in our part of the world. Across Asia, we have you know, own indigenous vocabularies of, of dealing with this. My concern is that, <sighs> When, when vocabularies like the vocabulary of politics of identity come to Southeast Asia, often they're tied to other struggles that are taking place outside Southeast Asia, which may not you know, be you know, as relevant or important um, to our immediate concerns in this part of the world. Um, I, I'll give you another example. I, I, I'm not comfortable with the way in which Southeast Asia is constantly being dragged into, you know, um, the security concerns of, say, the Western world, where, where perhaps you know, terrorism are important issues. Our main concern in Southeast Asia, as far as I'm concerned, is climate change. If there's one thing that's going to radically pose a threat, an existential threat to some Southeast Asian nations, it's actually climate change. But invariably, the problem with many Southeast Asian societies, like many post-colonial societies, is that we have to perform to the international community. We have to show how civilized we are, how modern we are, and we have to, to, to take on board their concerns as well. Um, and I think in the process of doing that, we forget, you know, this is the Eurasia we're talking about, we forget our own histories, forget our own vocabularies, we forget our own way of dealing with things like internal diversity, complexity, and fluidity. A lot of that has been gone. Believe me, by and large, there's a vast amount of indigenous Southeast Asian knowledges, knowledges in every sense, cultural, cosmological, philosophical, that most Southeast Asians are not familiar with. But that, like I said, is partly because they are too busy watching Game of Thrones. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, please. Uh, I, want, I want to commend uh, both Farish and Brenda for their wonderful presentations. But there's also a sort of underlying foundation of optimism that guides your discussions, which is interesting because that's good. But we live in a world where there's a kind of a global backlash against multiculturalism. President Trump says 
no more Muslims in America. Angela Merkel has partially lost her job because she admitted too many Syrian migrants into Germany. Even in India, which is highly multicultural, there are new tensions. And if you go to China, there are new tensions also within Xinjiang and the rest of China. So in a world where multiculturalism is being challenged, how can Southeast Asia still remain optimistic that it will be positive and successful in this dimension? Thanks, Kishore. Is there a question over there? Yes. Uh, thank you for your insightful, insightful presentation. Uh, my name is uh, Anissa, and I'm from United World College of Southeast Asia. And I just had a question about how sometimes you see people use such similar terms to identify themselves with. Like, for example, people from Hong Kong will identify themselves as Hong Kongers and not Chinese. And how people from Pakistan will say, oh, I speak Urdu and not Hindi. So I guess my question is, do you think these vocabularies used uh, are the reason for this divide, or is it the history behind behind these terms that shape these perspectives? Thank you. Thank you. Can I have one more? Yes, please. Hello, uh, good afternoon. My name is Angie. I'm from Brahm Center, a social service agency. Uh, I have two points uh, and with questions. One is uh, with regards to inclusivity as we are a maturing nation. It has been 30 years since I raised the concern about us being the new colonials to people who are coming here to work as maids. And um, 30 years ago, I raised this when Singapore Cricket Club kicked my helper out from being able to dine with me. And as a result of that, I got kicked out by the club. It is 30 years later and nothing much has changed. So when is our attitude going to become more exemplary that we're not going to treat the maids and the chauffeurs, as they're called, uh, as not being permitted to dine with anyone else in the club? Because Crick Club, if I was told correctly, used to have a sign that says, no entry to dogs and Chinese. And the other point about LGBT, if we're going to be inclusive and we are accepting multilingual, multiracial, multigender, it is time that we also enable our sons and daughters to be regarded in the same way without feeling that they're going to be criminalized. I want to declare I'm not an LGBT member, nor my children, so this is not done with a personal agenda. But I think it's time that we accept these people as they are without making them feel they're not good enough for our society. Thank you. Okay, just I'll take one more question here. Hello. Yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, so I'm from SMU and I'm actually curious to talk about the question on immigration. So Ms. Yu actually shared about how Singapore is actually built on a migration-led diversity. And yet we can see now that many Singaporeans are not comfortable with immigration, like we can refer to the 2011 elections where there's slogans about Singapore for Singaporeans. So I'm wondering like, in where was the shift from migration-led diversity that we see in the past and why is it like this now? And also linked to Mr. Faris about his point about complexity and being comfortable with complexity. And then in that case, how can Singaporeans be trained or be educated in a way that we can be comfortable with complexity now in this world. Thank you. Thank you. Let me invite Brenda to speak first. And then. Uh, I'll take that last question first, but just to, to in a sense, uh, respond to Kishore that uh, I, um, I, I guess academics basically refuse to be either optimistic or pessimistic. We usually sort of sit on the fence and see how, how which way the, the ball sort of lands in. So, uh, but I would say that uh, I share your, your concerns and pessimism. I, I think this is a point in, 
history where we are seeing sort of uh, not just uh, small pockets of uh, ethno-nationalisms uh, emerging, but also across uh, multiple continents and so forth. So this will be a moment to watch. But, but let me come to that last question, uh, which was on Sila, my memory is... Uh, on migration-led sort of diversity, and when was the turning point? I think as I was trying to illustrate in the talk, uh, there was no just one turning point, but a major shift has to do with the move from a colonial regime to the nation-building regime, where in a sense, borders have to be hardened and, and closed in order for uh, nation states to, in, to deal with internal problems and uh, form a, a an identity of their own. So uh, this then is the uh, imperative of nation building. You have to, in a sense, identify who belongs to the us and who belongs to the them. So the lines of divide uh, have to be drawn somehow even as you sort of work on the ties that bind within the nation state. This particular logic basically uh, comes into tension with our other logic, which is to be an open, cosmopolitan, uh, global city that's able to thrive on the energies and the creative tensions that uh, uh, people, n n immigrants bring. So it is this tension between the two that leads to um, our current sort of uh, ambivalent anxieties about uh, migrant labor. Um, I will also want to, in a sense, uh, complicate the situation by saying that uh, we actually have quite a bifurcated system of thinking about migrant labor because um, our system allows us to, in a sense, um, invite those who have skills the, and those who can contribute to join us as residents, permanent residents, and uh, hopefully citizens as well in order to replenish our population pool. Uh, but uh, we do have a uh, use and discard kind of mentality uh, to answer the, the, the question that was posed um, at that corner of the room uh, in terms of the migrant labor that belong to the uh, work permit uh, holder class. Um, and um, I think there are anxieties that um, the nation state will be swamped uh, by these uh, working class immigrants if we loosen control over them and uh, the kinds of social anxieties mean that uh, we don't even allow for um, migrant workers to live normal lives in terms of marriage and, um, and, and giving birth to children, for example. So these become uh, issues of contention uh, because of this um, ambivalence about where the boundaries of the nation state ought to be drawn. And I think that we should, in a sense, look into the looking glass of history a bit more to reflect not so much on the similarities and differences. I mean, you can't, in a sense, compare what's happening in the colonial era with the current era because the context is completely different. But I think what we could do is to look into the looking glass of history and look at the kinds of value systems that underpinned the colonial system of uh, migrant labor and think carefully whether these uh, sort of values uh, should be, in a sense, uh, the ones that we adopt for our current uh, context, uh, whether this is to do with race diversity or diversities in terms of sexuality. Thanks, Brenda. Farish? Um, just to respond to Kisho, um, you know I do not have an optimistic bone in my body, so, so I'm not optimistic at all. Uh, and and, and you, you know how pessimistic I am about, about uh, the state of the world today. But I think, having said that, I'm also a realist. And, and, I, and, and in trying to address the other two questions, including the one about uh, diversity and about migrants, look, let, let's, let's, let's be frank about what states can do and what societies can do. They're two completely different spheres. No state in the world, doesn't matter how strong the state is, even the most, the most authoritarian state with every weapon in its possession cannot compel its citizens to love one another. It cannot. No state can legislate a law that compels me to love my mother. It cannot. So there's a limit to what states can do. So stop harping on the state and expecting states to perform miracles. So my pessimism doesn't lie there. It lies with the societal trends that we're seeing now, which, in fact, many states cannot prevent. Um, what states can do is this. States can facilitate. 
States cannot compel people to love one another. States cannot compel you to understand difference. It cannot compel you to be comfortable with difference and complexity, but states can facilitate those who do. And that's where the state comes in. The state has to create avenues for understanding genuine communication, ethical communication, you know, not, not falling back on cliches and stereotypes, but actual meaningful human contact and human recognition to recognize that common humanity that we share. That's what states do. Now, the pessimism that I have, and I think you have as well, Kisho, is that when we look at the world around us, we actually see states doing the opposite encouraging forms of majoritarian politics, encouraging forms of narrow exclusive identity politics that can even be backdated historically to, ha to perform these historical erasures. That's where the danger comes. Now, as to what Southeast Asia does now and in the future, Singapore and the rest of, 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 of our, the neighboring countries, it's, you know, to, to, to echo what Brenda has just said, we can, go th we can look at events in the past to look at instances of success and failure and perhaps learn from those failures and try not to repeat those same mistakes. But the point I wanted to make was that, you see, the reason why I'm worried about the way in which debates about multiculturalism and cosmopolitanism and pluralism are happening today is that these terms are seen as somehow new. <laughs> Most of us who work on the pre-colonial history of Southeast Asia will tell you that you know, our societies were far more diverse, in fact, perhaps even more dynamic than before the colonial period. It is said that, for example, at the height of its power in Malacca, 80 languages were spoken, presumably not by the same person, right? So what does this mean? It means we are talking about really complex societies. You look at Bunton, you know, you know, recorded in the work of Theodore de Brie in the 17th century, incredibly diverse port city with people all the way from, from, from Hadramaut, from China, from Burma, from India, everyone, the whole world was in Bantan. Why is it that our ancestors could live with multiculturalism and complexity? What's wrong with us today? You know, how is it that Southeast Asians 300 years ago were cooler than us? What's happened to us? Well, what's happened to us is modernity. And with modernity, the sort of compartmentalizing logic of you know, fixed static identities. I do not believe that this, you know, I mean, historians will tell you that nothing is ever static. It will change in time. And this is already happening, as we saw just now in these you know, young people speaking. That's already happening. So what the state can do is therefore facilitate these moments of genuine interaction, genuine respect, genuine recognition of the common humanity that we share. And that's why you know, it's up to us. If we decide you know, to, to, to allow divisive central fugal politics to, 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 to dominate across Southeast Asia, well, then so be it. Then Southeast Asia will just end up being another, you know, um, balkanized part of the world like the rest of the planet. I hope that doesn't happen. So in my job as, as an academic and my job as a historian, I try to recover these things to remind us of these counterfactual possibilities, that it doesn't have to be this way, that it does not have to be this way. And I think that is liberating. Thank you. On that optimistic note, we have 14 minutes and we can take more questions. Yes, please. Um, from ethnic quotas for housing and gender and um, racial requirements for key appointment holders, what is a healthy level of prescriptiveness for our policies? Actually, your question was not clear. Would you please repeat that and speak uh, more clearly and loudly into the microphone? Yeah, the, the key question I'm trying to ask is, what's the healthy level of prescriptiveness for our policies in regarding um, ensuring social cohesiveness? So, for example, in Singapore, we see how ethnic uh, quotas for housing can help um, encourage interactions between races. But then we also see racial requirements for key appointment holders uh, in Singapore and even in Canada, for example. Uh, so, what's a healthy level? Okay, thank you. Can I... Next, please. Yes. Hi, um, Yaakov from SIT. Um, Brenda Paris, very good presentation. But, Farish, just to get your reaction back to the issue of uh, Southeast Asian identity, I firmly believe that we need to have something about that in our own identity. I've mentioned in Parliament recently that I'm a son of Singapore, but a child of Nusantara because everything in Nusantara that happens, happens to me. 
The question is, how do you then celebrate that part of the identity? We heard from Professor Peter Boschberg that Singapore used to be a naval base for the Malacca Sultanate. Can I, as a Malay Singaporean, celebrate the achievements of the Malaccan Sultanate without causing others to question my patriotism? Um, much as like what we have done with Lieutenant Adnan, is being both celebrated in Singapore and in Malaysia. So I don't think we should fight over chicken rice or Bangawan Solo, but how can we bring societies in the region together to celebrate each other because it's part of our identity? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there another question? Do I see one more? Yes, please. Uh, Matthew Ting from the Silent Foundation. Uh, actually, it's slightly related to uh, Jakob's question as well. Is uh, Sometimes we, we think of ourselves as, uh, let's say, Singaporean Chinese or uh, you know, uh, Singaporean Malay or even uh, Malaysian Chinese or, and so on. Um, and then you talk about a Southeast Asian identity. So let's say, how, how, how far will we get if we say, okay, I'm a Singaporean Southeast Asian or I'm a Thai Southeast Asian uh, a Vietnamese Southeast Asian, and do you, do you think we will ever get to that level, or should we even uh, uh, want to be getting to that kind of level? Uh, and then you have a, you, then you have even the, 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 the triple hyphenation. I'm a Singaporean Chinese Southeast Asian, kind of thing. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, please. Thank you. Um, just to ride on that, and also to uh, continue the theme of counterfactual possibilities new imaginings that Farish, you've talked about. Um, can I just invite you to share with us because you have traveled the region. What are the views, what are the images that our neighbors, our friends and brothers in the region have of us as Singaporeans? And therefore, secondly, what can we do to properly engage them, not just state-led, state but our business leaders can do it, our Community leaders can do it, our students can do it, we can do it. So what can we do? And finally, I'm really, really excited by the, the, the vision of us rediscovering our complexity and diversity so that perhaps Brenda can address this. We get past what is CMIO, which may be necessary for politics because we want to ensure that there's inclusion and integration so that CMIO tells us who we've left out. But can we leave that aside for everything else in life and celebrate our diversity and be more meaningfully connected to the region? So, thank you. Okay, thank you. I can't resist this. Gillian, do you really want to know what the region thinks about Singaporeans? <laughs> okay, let me... Uh, Brenda, would you like to go first? Thank you. I guess I'm a bit bemused by the fact that we talk about Southeast Asia as though it's out there. I mean... Um, Aren't we in Southeast Asia, and isn't Southeast Asia here in us, with us? I mean, and in that sense, I mean, um, why this angst about uh, sort of identifying a difference between Singaporean identity vis-a-vis -vis Singapore, uh, Southeast Asian identity? Uh, many families these days have uh, someone coming from Vietnam or Thailand or the Philippines, uh, and um, our families are diversifying. So in that sense, I think complexity is not just out there in the region, it is uh, and, and something that we should, uh, in a sense, embrace, but it is very much in us and with us. Uh, and um, I think um, in both our presentations and what we see is a colonial simplification of complexity, um, whether it's in the form of uh, census categories or the way in which uh, policies are prescribed. Uh, and um, I guess my plea would be for um, a bit more sort of um, flexibility in the way that uh, policies are prescribed. So to, to the question of prescribing policy, uh, uh, I have to say that uh, academics don't prescribe policy, so I don't have an answer to that one. Uh, but certainly uh, a lot more flexibility in the way that we think. And I think um, Farish traveling around the region and, and gathering sort of uh, sound bites from the region is one thing that uh, Singapore could do a bit more of. I mean, not just in terms of uh, Farish or, or, or the usual sort of policy visits, but uh, as our people basically traverse the region and uh, interact with them, uh, of the, pe the people in, in, in Southeast Asia, whether this is through marriage, this is through economics, I think uh, that complexity will soon become very much part of our everyday life. Thank you, Brenda. Farish? 
just to follow up on that, I'll give you an anecdote from my, my travels. Uh, once in Bangkok, uh, I was at the Wat Arun uh, temple. We were f filming a documentary. And a group of Indonesian students from a, from a university in Jakarta were there. They were doing architecture. So I asked these Indonesian students, um, you know, um, what, what do you think, looking at this, this famous temple that's a landmark of, of, of Bangkok? And, and the students spontaneously said, Oh, kita senang sekali. Kan ini budaya kita. Kan ini tamadun kita. You know? Oh, we are very happy. Isn't this our culture? Isn't this our civilization? These are Indonesians in Bangkok appreciating the Wat Arun Temple. It was one of the happiest days of my life. Despite my general pessimistic outlook, this is one of the happiest days of my life because there I thought, here you have really Southeast Asia coming into being. Indonesians who saw Thai classical architecture as part of their common Southeast Asian heritage. And, and the, to Jakob's point about can we celebrate, it, it's already been happening. Uh, Jakob, uh, the Indonesian Navy, for instance, has among its frigates, you know, ships named after Hang Tuah, Hang Le Kiu, Hang Le Kir, Hang Kasturi. And there are many of these instances where we already have this cross-border sharing, because like it or not, we, I agree with Brenda, we, we are all carriers of this common fluid history. It's in us. It's just that of late, of late, a kind of narrow nationalist parochialism has seeped into Southeast Asia, uh, partly uh, because of the competition uh, you know, uh, between states, our rush for foreign capital or what have you. Uh, and that then relates to the question about how does the rest of Singapore see, um, how does Southeast Asia see Singapore? Are you sure you want me to answer this? Uh, okay. Let's, okay, let's be black, uh, frank. Eh? We are all adults here. So uh, Singapore has a very interesting image in other neighboring countries. I'm basing this purely on, on, on you know, personal anecdotal experiences. It's, it's ambivalent, of course, yeah? It's positive and negative at the same time. On the negative side, of course, the word kiasu comes up. Um, and, and it's like, oh, always want to be first, always want to be first, always want to be first. But on the other hand, there's the idea of this is something worth emulating. Um, for instance, you know, sometimes I've seen development projects in Indonesia, a new condo comes up and, it, and they'll be on the poster Singapore standard. Uh, and what does that mean? It means very clean. Uh, and I think these are, all of us, all the nations, all the states of Southeast Asia, we all have ambivalent views of one another. This is perfectly normal. This is perfectly normal. And I think if we are really honest with ourselves, we can have a regional discussion, we can have a national discussion, we can talk about these things. But again, you don't have to look beyond that other, and this is the important point that Brenda mentions, the other is inside, it's here. Now, thank you very much for talking about these mixed marriages. This is something I've raised, I don't know how many times I've raised this at so many ASEAN meetings. Um, apologies to the ambassadors in the audience, but there are millions of ambassadors. There are millions of ambassadors. If you look at Southeast Asia, one thing I would really like to see a study of international marriages across Southeast Asia. The numbers must have risen by now. I speak as a Malaysian married to a Singaporean um, of, from, of Indonesian origin. I don't have to look for ASEAN. It's at the dinner table every time I go back. It's there. This is true for many of us. Now, no ASEAN state has ever considered seriously treating these people. These are the bridge builders. These are the complex families whose children will be complex, and they, will, they, they are the ones who are most likely to carry the idea of this ASEAN. It's in these families that you won't have disputes over chicken rice or batik or wayang kulit or whatever. You won't, because these families have that complexity already within, and yet not a single state that I know of in Southeast Asia has actually tapped into this. So that's one. But to follow Brenda's point, this is my pessimistic side coming in now. Let's not just celebrate this sort of, you know, um, cross-border marriages uh, as, as one, a panacea, and two, let's not forget that cross-border marriages don't just happen on the level of professional elites. Many of them are actually at a very ordinary working class level. My only, my, one of my biggest fears is that ASEAN, Southeast Asia, 
splits into two. A sort of small cluster of plural, comfortable, open-minded, cosmopolitan, Southeast Asian elites, buffeted and cushioned by capital, who are quite comfortable in Singapore, Jakarta, Kuala Lumpur, Manila, Bangkok, you know, in their cafe latte drinking, sushi eating circuits, yeah? Swimming on a sea of 600 million poor Southeast Asians who are not mobile and who have no, no mobility and no access to mobility. We do not celebrate these marriages when they are among the working classes, factory workers, you know? And these, now, that, that is the kind of slippage, the silencing that I think we need to be cautious about because ASEAN is this complex thing and all our component members, all our states, including society, is part of this complexity. So if you're going to really recognize and address complexity, well, address it properly. Yeah? Don't just look at the happy side. Look at the complexity, warts and all, everything, yeah? and, and understand it. I think this is a very exciting time for Southeast Asia and I think we're heading towards you know, a very exciting future. But let's be realistic about this as well. Thank you. Okay, so uh, there's only one and a half minutes left and I don't think it's time for, for questions. Um, would you please join me in thanking the two speakers for very engaging insights. Um, and uh, thank you to IPS for inviting me to be a part of this panel and thank you to the audience for a robust discussion. I'd like to close the session formally but invite you to talk with the speakers over tea. Thank you very much.